questions today. And I feel, I felt God give this to me on last Monday. It's how urgent I just felt God deal with me that quickly. Just got to praying about Sunday and just felt God tell me I was going to preach this this morning. And I feel God's going to help us here today. And I just feel today to deal with the subject of healing. Healing in the Word of God. I feel today to deal with that, and God knows why. But I just want to let you know here today, and if you remember a few weeks ago, I've made mention to it a few times, but a man by the name of Brother Nathan Davis came by and challenged our faith on a Sunday morning. I mean, remember this? He came by and preached on that faith and preached on believing. And I'm telling you, he just did something in me. And God will do that at times. He'll challenge you with His Word. And the Word brings faith. And I just feel today to deal along the lines of healing. And if you're in Galatians chapter 3, and let's start in chapter 2, if you will. Let's read in chapter 2. We're going to read quite a few verses of Scripture. And uh, and we're just going to read from uh, Galatians 2 and 20. But we're going to read right on, on in. And then we're going to go into Galatians 3 and read verses 1 through 5. Amen? If you're there, say amen. All right. Galatians 2 and 20 says this. For I, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. Amen. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You hear that? He don't want to frustrate the grace of God. You know, you can do that. And believe me, it happens every day in our churches. People frustrate the grace of God. Galatians 3, 1 through 5, it says this, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? He's saying some of you seen him crucified. Some of you know it. Some of you are eyewitnesses of this. And 3 and verse 2 says this, This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. He said, did you receive the Holy Ghost and the spiritual things by the law? Or did you receive that by faith? Verse 3, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles, notice that, worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? He's saying, does those that do miracles among you, do they do it by the works of the law or do they do it by faith? They do it by faith. Amen. And I'm going to preach to you today just simply on divine healing. I want to touch on this. And I feel the Holy Ghost want me to preach this to us as a church. And at the end of the service, we're going to pray for each other. Amen. And you know, that's what we need to do more of. The Lord's just really chastised me lately in services. You know, people giving prayer requests, I'm sick. And it's almost sometimes we get in too much of a rush. We need to anoint Him with oil. Yes. The Bible tells us to do these things. And, and we need to make room to pray for each other. And as a pastor, I desire to see divine healing even in this very church. It is sad to say that even today, there's some of us sitting in this building that's probably never seen a demon cast out. I'm going to let that sink in. Some of us in this room today may have never seen a divine miracle. It's almost like it is extinct among our Pentecostal churches when we put in our laws and our manuals that we believe in it. Yes. And when somebody becomes a member, we say, you need to believe in it. There's something that is missing, something that is wrong. And I'll tell you what it is. It's called worldliness. You know, worldliness is more than just a few trickets in the way we dress. Worldliness is a mindset. Yes. Some people think worldly. They may look the part on the outside or whatever, but they think worldly. Their mind is on worldly things all the time. I've got to do this. I've got to go here. I've got to buy this. I'm a part of this. I'm a part of that. I'm a part of that. And there we develop a worldly mindset. And let me tell you this. It's an old saying, but you know worldliness kills Pentecost. But Pentecost kills worldliness. Amen. Worldliness will step out and smother Pentecost, but true Pentecost will step out and smother worldliness. 
So talking to you today, my friend, I just want to preach to you from my heart. I want to talk to you about this thing called divine miracles. How we need to respond to it and things that we need to do. Because the truth is today, we have come so accustomed to not seeing it or seeking for it that many people are just content living in sickness and not even seeking for a miracle. And churches become content with people being sick that they don't really pray for each other to have these miracles. That's the truth. Maybe a little quiet this morning, but I've got to preach anyhow. Amen. I've learned that a long, 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 long time ago. Amen. Talking to you today, I'm just going to preach to you from my heart, and we're just going to begin to preach here. But some years back, my grandfather, something that was really an eye-opening experience for me, uh, my grandfather, uh, my granddaddy Byron is what we called him, he came down some years back with pancreatic cancer. I had been saved a few years, and, and the doctors told him when they opened him up, they, uh, they looked in there, and they slowed him back up, and they said that he was so eat up with it, and that they gave him, I think, around six months to live. So I, I was just a young preacher at that time. And I know I'm still young in a sense now, but I was very young then. Amen. I didn't have near the experience or understanding or none of that that I have now. And I still need to learn more. But my granddaddy, when we found out he was sick, he instantly just went through a very melancholy, depressed state of mind. I was just, one of the things, my granddad was a great man and I loved him to death, granddaddy Byron was. But just to be honest with you, throughout his life, he wasn't the most spiritual, I would say, Christian. He wasn't, he came to church, he read his Bible. He prayed, but he needed to be filled with the spirit of multitude of other things. He needed to work on great God. But you know, even though he was faithful to church, you could still tell there was not that deep intimacy with the Holy Ghost. It just was missing in his life. Still a good Christian man, and no doubt I know where he is today. But I witnessed something there, my friend, that when my grandfather, great man, great great Christian there, I mean, did things right, just a good, faithful person, when he came down with his pancreatic cancer, I watched something come over him and just depressed mindset. I mean, just very discouraged and very low down in his condition there. And I made it a point as a young minister and as his grandson that I was going to make a point that every day that I could, I was going to go there and I was going to lay hands on him. I I thought to myself, Lord, you know, I would fast. I would pray. I would push aside the prayer. I would read the Bible on faith. I felt like I just, I I worked so hard trying to see a miracle there in his life and really felt at times that he was going to get healed. Just felt that in my heart. But it was just a long story short there. My granddaddy never got healed. Pancreatic cancer took him out of this world. He died here. He, he drew closer to God in those few months than he ever had been before. He sought God like he never had before. But just in that process, I learned something that there has to be in all of us, there has to be this endurance of faith inside all of us. Look, even though my granddaddy left this world from pancreatic cancer, and believe me, when it happened, it and was shell shocked me. I thought to myself, all the prayers that went up, all the meals that were missed in, the cottage prayer meetings we had there in that living room, and Lord, He still passed on. I thought to myself, Lord, do you still heal? Is it still available? I'd like to say that in 2014, that even though my granddaddy died from pancreatic cancer, my God still heals. Amen. You say, well, he died. But hear me, my friend. I, I believe there is a, believe me, I know there's a perversion going on in America in the Pentecostal ranks. I know there's a name it, claim it idea. I know there's some that teach and preach that they can heal on demand. But look today, friend, I've got no problem with healing in this building this morning. I know that my God is a healer. I know my God can heal anything. The problem I have is with healers. What that means is I'm not going to come here today and look at you and say, I am a special individual. I have this calling. I have this gift. And I am going to heal you. That is what's wrong in a Pentecostal race. When God heals somebody, it's because there's an individual that has faith, that pressed past everything, that pressed past elements, that pressed past pain, that pressed past a doubting mindset, that pressed past the flesh. They reached into the portals of heaven. They knocked on heaven's door. They bound together. They prayed together. They fasted together. They believed God together. And there God recognized that and faith was activated. Yes, there's going to 
be here with today, friend. Yes, there's times sickness takes people out of this world. I don't doubt that one bit. Yes, it does happen. But that does not make me doubt that my God is a healer. That does not make me doubt that my God can do anything. My goal today in this service is to stir up your faith to believe that God can do anything. Hear me today, friend. The reason I believe in, in the modern day Pentecostal ranks that so many people are disinterested, disinterested in church is because they never see anything that we preach. It shouldn't be somebody gets born again every other Easter. Yes. It shouldn't be that a demon or somebody... You know, are we doubting that there's demons in America? My Lord. It shouldn't be somebody gets deliverance every other camp meeting. It shouldn't be somebody gets, gets filled every other year. No, it should never be that way, my friend, because these are things that God gave us. He gave us these miracles because the Bible lets us know that miracles at times will even stir faith of others and other people come into the kingdom just through one miracle because somebody believed God and somebody touched heaven and somebody prayed the prayer of faith. We can read in the Bible, in the book of Acts there, one lame man getting healed and one sermon led to 5,000 people getting saved. One crippled man in one sermon. We'll preach a thousand sermons and see 20 saved. You see what I'm saying? What I'm trying to get us to understand is, we once again, I preached it a few weeks back, we once again have to witness the miraculous power of God, the dunamis of God, the miraculous power that God can move. We've got to understand this today. When we read in the Bible here, it lets us know, it says, hey, He therefore that ministered to you by the, by you the Spirit and work His miracles among you, do as He did by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. He's letting us know here, friend, there's nothing within that law that can produce that born again experience. It may point you the right way. It may deal with you. But look, my day today, my friend, if you do not have faith, it is impossible to please God. If you do not have faith, it is impossible to be, please God. He didn't say if your preacher didn't have faith. He didn't say if you anybody else didn't have faith. He said that if, if without faith, it is impossible to please God. We must understand this today, my friend. I read in Ephesians two and eight. It says this. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace and faith are not to be separated. But also we've got to understand this today. If we approach God in faith, there are gifts that He will give us. The Bible says to earnestly seek for the gifts. To desire the gifts. When's the last time you prayed for one? And I'm chastising all of us if that's all right. God does it to me. Can I tell you what God told me? All of us are to be seeking for the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Every single one of us. And hear me today, my friend. I tell you, my friend, I just feel what God has put in my spirit. We've got to understand this today. If we approach God in faith, He will give us that salvation. But we must understand this. When it comes to God's grace and His gifts and His miracles operating in our lives, there are two ways that you can go. You can go the legalistic way that says this. You have to earn your salvation. You've got to earn the Holy Ghost. And you've got to earn your healing. You climb that mountain if you want to, you'll get depressed. Been up it a few times myself. I climbed a few feet. I ran out of breath before I got a hundred foot off the ground. Climbed back down and said, God, I can't climb. And he said, I know you can't. I can. If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you can speak to that mountain. That's what we've got to understand. You can go the legalistic way and try to earn everything, or you can go the liberal way where they say there's nothing required. And believe me today, friend, there's a lot of people that think that too. But also understand this, you can see the imbalance in the Pentecostal church. We've once again got to find the balance and faith to understand that God is able to move even now. He's able to touch us in this very service. If we do not expect these things, such as faith, grace, and salvation as a gift, and that we are constantly trying to earn them, we will go back to the law, and all of us will get frustrated, and you'll end up being a dead, formal Christian. Amen. You know, we come to church. Another service. You know, it's Sunday morning. Oh, it's Sunday morning again. We're going to church. But do you leave here different? 
Do you leave here inspired? Or is this something we just go through? Hey, we have to understand this today. When the Bible says this, if we do not expect these things through faith, the Bible says when we do this, when we try to earn our salvation, try to earn our healing, try to earn all these different things that come through grace, when we do this, we frustrate the grace of God. That word frustrate there means we cast it off, we despise it, we disannul it, we frustrate, we bring to naught, we reject it. We need to return again to that balance where we understand when we come to the house of God, we don't leave here frustrating the grace of God, but we leave here saying, our God met with us, our God touched us, our God healed us, our God made Himself real to us, and we must return to that again. I watched the debate even this week. The question was this, why do they see more miracles on the mission field than they do in America? Why do they see more miracles on the mission field than they do in America? Some people could say, well, they need it more than we do. Believe me, my friend. You're saying there ain't people that need it here in America. There's a lot of people that need them miracles. But the problem is this. We've got so many other resources we try to bankrupt before we turn to the Lord in faith. We've got so many other avenues we'll try to walk down that before we turn to the Lord in faith, we got every other, we got every other psychiatrist. We got every other idea. We got every other medicine. We got every other this. And We'll try everything else before we simply come to the Lord with the faith that is willing to hold on. We've once again got to understand that He paid a price for us to receive this. He paid a price for us that everyone in this room today even can get saved. And when somebody don't get saved, what do we say to them? Oh, foolish folks. Pray for so-and-so. They need to get saved. And I don't know why they just can't see it. You know, God, Jesus paid it all for it. But let me tell you this today, my friend. Just as much as Jesus paid the way for your salvation, Jesus paid the way for your healing. Amen. The same faith that you're saved by. You know, how many people have actually seen? I know some may have seen him. I, I, I haven't. Seen Jesus in person. You know, I, I know the likes of the liberals see him every other day. You know, I said, did Jesus eat cereal, go fishing, you know, play soccer with them? You know, did Jesus everywhere. You know, it's, it's amazing. But nobody here has physically seen the Lord. Nobody here today, you're not an apostle. And I, I don't find your name in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He didn't reveal Himself to you post-resurrection. He didn't do that. Hear me today, friend. Nobody has seen Him. But hear me today, we would understand this. I know I'm saved today because I put my faith in what He did 2,000 years ago. And the Spirit bears witness of that now inside my soul. And I know that I'm free and liberated because Jesus died for me and He paid the price. So we look at somebody that's not saved and we say, oh, how foolish they are. But do we look at people that do not trust the Lord and put their faith in them and say, how foolish is that? We are to have that same approach. We are to have that same approach. We are to say, my Lord. But we also can understand He took a beating for our healing. In the same way that we get frustrated with people rejecting His salvation, we need to get frustrated when other individuals reject His healing. Your healing, my healing, everybody's healing. The beating and the crucifixion was not just for sins. It was not just for He. It wasn't for the sins of the Lord. They were for your and my sins. We understand Jesus knew fully well that we needed it and we've got to understand this again. We would understand that all sin, that all sickness is tied to that fall in the garden of Eden. We would understand that. That all in some form or some fashion sickness is a result of the fall in the garden of Eden. It is a result of sin entering into the world. So we can say that all sickness is a direct, I mean, is, is, is a result of sin and the fall in the garden of Eden. But let me clarify this. All sickness does not mean that you personally committed a sin. But Adam didn't need CPR in the Garden of Eden. He didn't need heartburn medicine like I do. Amen. He was in a perfect body. And in a perfect condition, a perfect environment there. So we must understand this today, that even though sickness is tied to sin, it does not mean that every individual that's sick has committed or is a result of a personal sin. Hear me today, friend. We've got to hear this because in churches I have witnessed this, that there's just one thing that can hinder miracles is that some are always trying to figure out what someone did to get in the mess that they're in. Amen. There's some people saying, I know why he's sick. Oh, yes. You'd have been, you'd, you'd got to ride along with Job's friends. You ought to have had a good old party together. I remember one time I have an uncle that uh, 
was a, it was a pill addict for 18 years or, or more. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about just a, a, a mild user. I mean, he got in more cars. It's a blessing. I don't, I don't know how he's alive. He'll tell you that. Here he is. He's been in more car wrecks. And I, I mean, I, I can tell you stories. And I mean, I, I, he'd come to the house sometime and eat with my dad. And I look over there and Uncle, da- Uncle so-and-so's face is down in the soup there. He's done fell asleep and passed out again. I've watched him in church services just, just pass out on the pews, laying on his son there. I mean, just so, so doped up on prescription medicine. I mean, it was one of the biggest shames. But I'll tell you, oh, oh my grandma, my granddaddy LT, brother, brother, brother Glenn there knows him some. They pastor a pioneer church there in North Carolina. And it was Uncle David's father there. And understand this, when my grandmother died, that my uncle said that he would never take another pill to get high again. He said it was the last time. And there through my grandmother's death, my uncle got born again. I'm not talking about he went to rehab. I'm not talking about he went up the road. He quit taking barbiturates to get high on them. I mean, he still had a lot of physical ailments today. But I remember one time we were praying for Uncle David and somebody says, you know why his foot's that way anyhow? You know, he makes his bed, he's going to lay in it. And there are people instantly would say, hey, look, I know it's common sense. I know there was something he did years ago that caused, caused his body to be mangled as it was. But I thought to myself, my Lord, when somebody gets born again, if, if we've gotten to the place we can sit there and label everything they did wrong, but we can't hold hands and pray the prayer of faith, I'm telling you something's wrong, my friend. Yes, there are times and there's cases where, see, where, where sickness can be a direct, a direct result of sinful practices. I can understand that a bad lifestyle will happen can bring you physical problems. Show me a man that smoked his whole life and get saved. I wouldn't doubt if he has lung issues. It happens. But this is something else I want to tell you today. That yes, it is important that any time somebody is sick or somebody is going through something, it is important that you search your heart. But this is something else you need to understand. Once you get born again, once you overcome that sin, once you pray through over it, and once the blood is applied, forget about it and move on. What the enemy always desires to do to people in church is this. Well, ain't no need asking God to heal you because you did that in sin. Ain't no need asking God to heal you because that was a bad decision you made then. Hear me today, friend. If you are born again, and if you are blood-bought, you are a direct candidate of the healing from the Lord. God can heal you. It doesn't matter what you did in your past. Leave it underneath the blood. Leave it there at Calvary. Pick up and walk on. Pick up and walk Oh, I wish somebody understand that today. You need to pick up and you need to walk on because God has forgiven you and now you are underneath His blessings. Hear me today, friend. There is nothing that what the devil desires to do to you. He wants you to get hung up on your past. He wants to get you hung up on your failures. He wants you to get you hung up on unbelief. He wants you to get hung up on everything else. And God wants you not to get hung up on that. But He wants you to come into the fullness of the Spirit that He can deal with you. I hear about, heard about a boy recently that got delivered from demonic possession. Tormented, schizophrenic. I mean, just in this situation, not saying all of it's tied to demons, but in this situation, he was hearing voices all the time. And from the, he said them voices were on the inside of him there. And Pastor Duke Downs prayed for him. They prayed the prayer of faith there. And this young boy got delivered. I mean, they seen the demons deliver. He delivered out of them. And here he was, this young boy. He came back and testified to Brother Duke Downs. He said, Brother Duke, he said, guess what? He said, the voices they didn't hear no more. They're out there. And Brother Duke said, you know what that is? He said, because that devil can't cross the bloodline. Amen. He said, the reason they're out there now, they're trying to accuse you, accuse you to the place so they can get back in there. He said, what it is, you've been delivered, son. He said, God set you free. And he said, the devil can't cross the bloodline because if he crosses the bloodline, he's going to have to get saved. So what I'm trying to get you to understand this today you know the devil's the accuser of the brethren? And night and day, he's constantly coming to the saints. He's bombarding you with doubt. He's bombarding you with unbelief, you know. Sometimes you feel a pain over here, and you'll say, oh, that's the same thing Mama has. Well, you know, so-and-so died from this. And, you know, I, you know believe me, I've went through some of those things myself. Get a sharp pain, don't know where it come from. It, it's cancer. I remember one time, it's comical, but my Lord... I, I was preaching in Ohio and staying in evangelist quarters that was hot. 
I, that's all I can say about it. The place was hot. I mean, I mean, it just, I don't know what it was. AC was on, but the way when the doors were shut, I didn't like to leave the doors open because it was connected to the church and, and just my own personal preference there. But it got hot in there. I had the AC. There was no circulation. I mean, I was in there. I would wake up just profusely sweating. And, and my wife said, man, I, you know what? I looked online. <laughs> And they said, if you sweat all the time like that all the time, you might have this. I said, don't put that in my mind. I said, are you... But the truth is, I thought about it. And I looked over there and she was sweating some too. I said, she's got it too. So what I'm saying is that enemy and fear constantly are trying to feed on you to get you to think of this and think of that. And as my granddad used to say in the pulpit, 90% of the things that you worry about never come to pass anyhow. Let's just trust God anyhow. If it comes to cancer, if it comes to an incurable disease, I'm telling you that God created this body. He's still able to heal you. He's still able to make you whole. Our God is still a healer. We've got to understand this. You assume, Brother Dick, I was discouraged from this instance. But God knows everything. Brother Dick, I thought they don't worry about so and so. Look, there is a greater healing. There's a going into another world where you're going to get a new body. You're going to get a, all them things are going to be new. Thank God for that day. But I promise you this if you're born again and in the will of God, you're not going anywhere that God's done with you. I've got that security today. If you are in the will of God, you're not going anywhere until God is done with you. We think of the subject of healing and. We've got to learn to overcome that accuser of the brethren. Hear me today, friends. Satan is constantly trying to tell you you're sick because of this or you're sick because of that. But we need to tell the devil you're a liar. You're a liar. And you're the father of all lies. Because we're going to go to the Bible today and we're going to look in here and understand that it was the will of God to heal. There's a story in the book of Luke that was when Jesus came down from a mountain. A leprous man came to him. And this leprous man, and we know the leprosy was, was a failure disease at that time. And that leprous man said this unto him, Lord, if thou will, thou canst make me whole. And he put forth his hand and touched him. And Jesus said, I will. The leper saying, Lord, if it's your will, heal me. The Lord said, I, I'm willing. And touched him. If you're willing, Lord, can you touch me? We come to church with that same mindset. And look, it's all right to pray for God's will. I know that. But I'm telling you today, God's willing even this morning. God's willing even in this service to heal us. We would understand in the Old Testament, it was tied directly to His name. We call Him Jehovah Rapha, which means He is the Lord that healeth thee. He tells us that in Exodus 15 and 26. If that, if that was His character and attribute in the Old Testament, if He was known as the Lord that healeth of us. He's an unchanging God. He tells us in His Word, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3 and 6, I am the Lord, and I change not. James 1 and 17, a God, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Hear me today, pray it. If God healed in the Old Testament, He still heals now. It's even an attribute of God. You know, people have certain attributes, and you can recognize them. One of God's divine attributes is healing. It's Jehovah Rapha's in His character. We understand this today when it comes to the New Testament. There was a man by the name of Jesus. You probably heard of him, amen? There was a man by the name of Jesus. He was a healer. I don't have time to go through all the verses, but Jesus walked the shores of Galilee. He went through Capernaum. He went through different areas throughout the Bible there. He healed the sick. He opened blinded eyes. He raised the dead. That's what Jesus did. You say, well, Brother Derek, that was for Jesus. But then we also know in Luke 9... He told the twelve apostles, He gave them power to heal. Then He didn't stop there. There were 70 disciples that we'll find also in Luke 10, and He gave them the ability to heal. You ever heard somebody say, well, that was just for the twelve apostles. You know, Peter could heal, so-and-so could heal, so-and-so could heal, but you know, 
Seventy other people also were given the very same gift. And not only that, but the Bible tells us that those that believe, Mark 16 says this, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall. Amen. In case you didn't know, that's red writing. Jesus said that. We would also understand that there is a gift of the Spirit that's called the working of miracles. So we come to this today and we must understand. I'll read that to you in 1 Corinthians 12 and 10. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. The Bible lets us know that we have that ability through the Lord. It's nothing as an individual, but we know that the Spirit of God is able to flow through us and help one another. And we can pray for one another. And we can see people healed. Now he said there in the book of Mark, he said, and these signs shall follow them that what? Believe. So if we believe, let me put it this way, if you believe, you will see them. If you don't believe, you will not see these. So the problem is this. There's a little word I want to talk to you about. And, and it's worse than any prostitute. That could ruin your church. You know, it's not the drugs that are ruining our church. It's not the streets. And look, we can blame it on ever so and so. The church, the government, this person in the street. Here, 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 and here. Here, all this is. That's the problem with the church. The world. No, this is the problem with the church. It's called unbelief. You know, we, we, we compare things in the supernatural. And try to compare them over to the things that God's wanting to do. We're saying, look, God, you, uh, look, Lord, I need this to be done, but I know it's not possible because it would take you doing this. And do we forget that the Bible tells us that our God can do anything? When we come to the book of James, chapter 5, it says this, and, and I'm, I'm going to ask you these questions and you can answer it yourself. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. He, that word afflicted there means undergoing hardships, going through those, those hardships, those battles there. Is any among you that are they, going through something in the body or in the mind or just a battle or a trial there? Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. I wonder if there's anybody afflicted this morning. Statistically, there is. Then it goes on to say, is any merry? Let him sing. So I look around, nobody, some, some people ain't singing. I'm wondering, they must not be married today. Or oh, they hadn't read James chapter, chapter 5 there. Amen? If you're married, let them sing. Then it goes to James 5 and 14. Is any sick among you? I wonder if there's anybody in this room today. Is anybody sick? There is. Let's just, we could all say that together. There is. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, guess what it does? It availeth much. We must understand this today. When it talks here, he says, if any sick among you, two things that are due, call for the elders of the church, and if there's any sins that's been committed, just simply confess them. And let me understand, that means that don't mean you've got to tell everybody about it, unless you've done somebody wrong, but at least tell the Lord about it. We look at this, and then it goes on to say, for the thing for the elders to do, anoint with oil, invoke in the name of the Lord, and guess what will recover the sick? You think it's something to do with this anointing oil? No, it's not. I don't, I don't know what this is. I hadn't read the brand. Frankincense. Oh, wow. That's different. I, I use the olive oil. Amen. It's a different oil here. But this is not the healing key. The healing key, it says this, and the pray the prayer of faith. It says the results is this, the Lord will raise him up and the sin shall be forgiven him. So if we would take James 5 literally, we would understand this today. If there's anybody sick among us, we ought to pray for him. Come on now. When I was younger, you didn't have church till you had a prayer line. Yeah. 
You say prayer lines were tent. No, it ain't got nothing to do with the tent meeting. It's praying for the sick. It's praying for the afflicted. It's praying for those that have sinned. Man, yeah, prayer lines. I've seen prayer lines before line up 30 or 40 people deep. When I say it, that far out. And boy, I guarantee I've seen some look at their watch. It's going to take a while. You know what we need to do? We need to get a team here, a team here. No, the Bible says, call for the elders. Sometimes there ain't enough folk to go around that believe and have faith. Hear me today, friend. You ought to come up here when you pray for somebody or when we pray together. You ought to come up here believing. You ought to come up here with faith. You ought to come up here saying, I know my God's going to do something and I know God's going to heal. I've heard them say before, well, I was raised this way. The Bible trumps the way you were raised. If you were raised in a zoo, it doesn't matter. The Bible says pray for them. Well, I don't know if God does. God does. How do I know? Let me sing that little kid song. The Bible tells me so. Amen. That's how I know God still heals. It's simply the Bible. The Bible lets us know that He does this. It tells us here the results will be this. The Lord will raise them up. The Lord will raise them up. We've got to understand this today. Because when it goes on to say this, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed because the effectual fervent prayer of righteous men availeth much. It's saying this, that we need to bind together, confess and pray for one another. We live in an individual-minded society. You know, some people feel like, well, if nobody knows I'm going through this, that that's, doing, that's not doing you any good. Look, there's some things I know you'll face that you don't have to tell nobody, just God will bring you through. But I guarantee God didn't put seven billion people on the face of this earth for you to carry everything on your own. I guarantee that. As a matter of fact, if I didn't have some brothers and sisters that I've confided in over the years and still confide in, I don't even know where I'd be today. Because there's times that I can grab a brother by the hand and say, you know what, let's trust God together. Just like when my granddad was sick, believe me, my friend, I had to grab my grandmother by the hand and say, we're going to trust God together. As my wife comes to the piano, and I just feel to go a certain way in the altar call, and I'm just going to obey the Lord. But if you would stand to your feet, and... I know it seems a little quiet this morning, but my friends, it doesn't matter. God is still a healer. And if on your mind right now, if you're thinking of, I can't wait to eat, shame on you. Shame on you. Man, we've forsaken more moves of God for a Chinese buffet than anything I've ever seen. I mean, it really is a, it's a pitiful plight on the church. It is. If you're thinking of anything about this afternoon, a game or anything, shame on you. When we got brothers and sisters that sit sick among us. And we struggle to make the prayer of faith. Shame on you. And shame on me if that was the case. Even here recently, I felt the Holy Ghost deal with me so strongly. Because my mind was on after service when I was sitting in service. And I'm the pastor. Had something I was supposed to do. And I'm thinking of this, and I'm thinking of that, and I'm thinking of this, and I'm sitting there, and next thing you know, 20 minutes gone by. Have I believed God? The Bible tells us, and if we're going to be Holy Ghost filled Pentecostal churches, we've got to believe what it says, and we've got to live it.